Thank you, Rudy, for keeping us up to date. Now, you know, there's a there's this really interesting book that just came out. Well, and, and it didn't really just come out. It actually is an old book. He just updated it. And we're going to talk about this book in just a second. It's about church history. And it's kind of f- interesting because I was <laughs> I was looking at the uh, reviews of the book, and he got a review from William Buckley Jr., right? Oh, wow. And I didn't realize at first I didn't, it didn't put the dots together that it was a, a updated version. And I was like, how did they get – William Buckley Jr. to write a review of the book if he's dead. Through necromancy, duh. Right, Just right. kidding. Like the, Condemned uh, by the church, by the, the way. Witch of Endor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there you go. That sounds like something out of like a, a J.R.R. Tolkien novel. Thou shalt not uh, suffer a witch to live. Is that what it says? Uh, no, that's my personal stance oh, okay. on witches. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. All right. Well, it's an excellent book, and it's, it was the greatest praise it was given in my opinion, it was from Warren Carroll, who said it is the greatest one novel or one one book that is on church history, and it's been updated. And so make sure you check that book out. It's called Triumph, the Power and Glory of the Catholic Church, a 2,000-year history. Uh, joining us right now is Harry Crooker. Good morning to you. Good morning. Thank you. Now, your last name, is it Crooker or Crocker? Crocker. Crocker. Like, like Betty Crocker, if I remember the old, <laughs> or Crocker Banker, or those sorts of things. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Make sure I want to make sure I got that correct. Now, Mr. Crocker, this book of, uh, may, had very high praise in terms of uh, its regard to church history, but, you know, many people really don't have, especially Americans, we don't really have a good sense of history, especially history outside of our country. We're very siloed and even then i'm very disappointed with a lot of people's knowledge of american history Uh, so let's start from the beginning why should people care about church history well i will cite my personal experience i am a convert uh, and i wrote this book in large part because it is the book i wish i had when i was converting and when when i was converting part of my my, my conversion was almost entirely intellectual, but part of it, a big part of it, was historical. Um, Cardinal Newman, who's sort of actually an inspiration for this book in some ways, um, he made the famous comment that to be deep in history is to cease to be a Protestant. And he goes on to say, and Protestants have always known it to be so, or why would they base their religion solely on the Bible? Um, and for me, I, I've written on other aspects of history. I've actually written a lot about American history and military history. The historical argument for the faith struck me as the most compelling, mm. aside from all the others. And, um, but I wanted a church history. I was looking for a church history for myself that didn't get caught up in the sort of things that I think push American readers away. They, they think that all these theological debates are abstruse or dry as dust and all these names are foreign and all that sort of thing. This is not that at all. This book is meant to be I, I sometimes describe it as a Catholic history book for adolescent boys, <laughs> mm. because it's meant to be all about the marching of Roman legions and crusader swords clashing and conquistadors conquering the new world. And that sort of spirit, the spirit of adventure, the spirit of drama, the sort of true-to-life swashbuckling adventure, which is in large part the Catholic Church, is, is, is the purpose of the book. It's a... It's a, it's a Unapologetic uh, uh, apologia for the for the Catholic Church. Yeah, that's a that's wonderful, and I think that that's really really good because, like like you mentioned, I mean, there's really not there was not really too many places to find outside of academia good books covering all of church history. You could uh, find little things here and there, uh, but a one stop shop really there was not much out there. Uh, so. I, it would be too much of a task to try to say, okay, let's go over church history. But let's say this. What about church history is important for us to know in regards to recognizing where we stand in church history? Yeah, no, that's a very good question. And I, um, I wrote a piece recently where I made this case that a lot of Americans think that we are a creedal nation. We are a nation based on a creed. Well, if that is true, I, you know, where, where do we find this creed? It's not in 
it's not in the Constitution. The Constitution is merely a framework of government. You can put all sorts of different things within that framework. It's not the Declaration of Independence, which is largely a list of compa- complaints against the, the king. Um, but there is that one section, that early section in the Declaration, which everyone loves to quote, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, etc., that they are endowed by the Creator. The, well, those alleged self-evident truths, as posited by a, a deist in Thomas Jefferson, are only self-evident within a Christian framework, mm. within a Judeo-Christian civilization. Because if you go back in history, or if you, if you go lo- look outside the Christian world, those are not self-evident truths. Right? I mean, it, it's Christianity which brings to the world uh, things like mercy being a virtue, or charity, or tolerance, or separation of church and state. All these other things, they come from Christianity. And when, when Christianity recedes and paganism moves forward, what, what replaces those things? So we, we're seeing what replaces those things. It's power. All relationships are based on power. And you can see this from everything from, say, feminism, which takes the most intimate aspects of human life and makes them all power relationships. You can see it in critical race theory, where everything is about you know, which race is up and which race is down, which color is up, which color is down. And, or you can see it in the whole gender madness today, where everything is like, it's not just about power in that sense, not just about, uh, it's about denying reality, hmm. denying objective reality, that's what you make of it. But all these, all these distortions of the, of the way that humanity should actually be, that human beings should actually live, come from a fading Christianity. So if we're ever going to, re, if we, if we're going to restore our country, I know many people think we live in crazy times now, and we do. But if we're ever going to get out of these crazy times, you know, the answer is to get back to what we thought was normalcy, and normalcy is Christianity. Christianity is a reality, and the Catholic Church is the, is the beacon that can shine this reality. It is, you know, if, you're, if you're looking to stop the madness of today, you're not going to find the, the Free Church of Scotland or, you know, right. or, the, or the, all these small separated churches. They're, they don't have the power, the intellectual resources, the size, anything, the philosophy to, 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 to stop this. Mm-hmm. The one institution which can stand for human freedom and the Christian civilization we have inherited, because it built it, is the Catholic Church. Amen. Wow, that's great. Praise be to God. I <laughs> There's so many uh, little threads that you, you dropped along, and I'm trying to decide uh, which thread to pick up. But there is a... And one thing that I kind of uh, was thinking about when you were speaking there is about where are we going? We, we all recognize this problem. We all recognize that we live in crazy times. And like you said, we certainly do live in crazy times. And I'm thinking of the, and I talk about this often, I'm thinking about Professor Plenio Correa de Oliveira, who talked about the revolution, and he says the revolution is disorder, and so the counter-revolution has to be a restoration of order. And he says, what do I mean by restoration of order? He says, a return to Christian civilization. The problem is, we as Americans, and we, well, I guess we as just Catholic peoples in general, have no idea what Christian civilization is. We have no concept of it. We don't know where it came from, how it got there, uh, how it fell. How and They know nothing about Christendom. And so I think that's very, very important to keep in mind. We're about to go to a quick break. Uh, when we come back, I wanted to pick your brain about that. I wanted to ask you, uh, what is Christian civilization? Uh, how did we get to Christian civilization? And how did we lose it? That's a large question, but we're going to try to summarize it in as short a manner as we can. Stick with us. We'll be right back. Harry Crocker, not Crooker, Harry Crocker is joining us talking about his book, Triumph. Check it out. You can get it on Amazon or Regnery Press. We'll be right back with more Catholic Drive Time right after this. Don't go anywhere. We'll see you very soon. And welcome back to Catholic Drive Time. This is your host, Adrian Fonseca. It's so good to be on with you today. Praise be to God. Despite the horrific things happening in the world today, it is still good to be here. Just remember, just remember, despite of it all, our Lord is still king and our lady is still queen. And they are king and queen over history, king and queen over our nations, and king and queen over our hearts. 
Just remember that today and give God some praise that you are still here. Now, joining us right now is Harry Crocker. He wrote an amazing book called Triumph, going over the 2,000-year history of the Catholic Church. And before we went to break, I mentioned the question of, you know, we want to be counter-revolutionaries. We want to have a restoration of order, and restoration of order is the re- restoration of Christian civilization. But most of us don't know what Christian civilization is. And so my question, Mr. Crocker, is what is Christian civilization? All right. Well, <laughs> small question. Small question. Is really, yeah, is really. Um, I'm not give you a sort of academic question. It's it, it starts off as the inheritance of a Christianized Rome. Um, there's a famous historian called uh, Will Durant who said that Western civilization is the marriage of Caesar and Christ, and there's something to that. But I think uh, one of the things we can take from uh, the history of Christian civilization. It was, is hope and faith, and I, I, I mean this beyond a supernatural sense. I mean purely beyond the practical sort of nuts and bolts. If you're reading history in a secular way, even even there you can see, well, look, it, this 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 religion which changed the world started off in this little small place in a distant Roman province, and took over the greatest empire of its time, took over Western Europe, <laughs> toppled every pagan empire it encountered and evangelize the world. Now, how did it do this? <laughs> um, now, the, there, are, there are a couple good answers, but one of them is the power of example. I mean, if you go back to the ancient Romans, this is what shocked them over and over again. Was, there's a famous quote, look at how these Christians love one another. And look how they go joyfully to be martyred. Um, now, in... Once the world is conquered, how is it lost? That was part of your question, too. Um, and we can, I mean, actually, the, the book is both, it's called Triumph. It's about the triumph, how this all happened. But also, it, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, look at it in rose-colored glasses, because obviously we have fallen off dramatically in the Christian influence in the world, the Catholic influence in the world. And you can see that, for, for, you know, extending over a long period of time, depending on how you want to measure it. But most strikingly, in modern times. Um, and there's a famous, let me go back to like World War II, <laughs> to make us less intellectual, but more, again, sort of just like nuts and bolts history. In World War II, a famous British writer named Evelyn Waugh, a Catholic, um, at the beginning of World War II, near the beginning of World War II, there was the Nazi Soviet Pact. At one point, Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia were allies, or at least uh, com- <laughs> joining forces to attack Poland and, and so forth. And Evelyn Waugh wrote, this is the modern world in arms. And that was the modern world. The modern world was Nazi Germany, which was a regime that consciously strove to go back before Christianity and reinstore violent paganism. And you had Soviet Russia, an overtly, violently atheistic regime. And arrayed against this, and right against this was Christian civilization, which you could even call like the deracinated remnants of Christian civilization, but which had enough of it to know that it, what it was. Winston Churchill, Franklin Roosevelt, Dwight David Eisenhower, the leaders of the Allied cause, called it a crusade and called it a crusade for Western civilization, for Christian civilization, repeatedly. Um, and that's what was sick. We, we won that one. <laughs> But, you, but, but the decline, I mean, there's a little bit of resurgence like in the 1950s, but, but the general decline is one which is really kind of shocking, and especially in the 21st century, you can see when the century turns, the, the decline gets dramatic. And why, why would this be so? Why would this be? You would, you would think, in fact, that now, because the world has gone so crazy, people would say, wait a second, where did all this transgender stuff come from? Where is sanity? And you would think they would turn to the obvious answer, which is, well, it's what you left behind. It's the Catholic Church. But what I think is really happening, there have been some great studies about this, is that if you look at the decline, it's largely driven by young people. And they're not losing their faith in college, as people seem to assume. They lose it long before that. They lose it before their parents even notice. They lose it when they're like 14. And the reason is, because instead of reading Catholic history and getting inspired by all 
the great saints and heroes of our past, they're finding sufficient meaning in the most foolish, fatuous things like social media and computer games and all that sort of stuff, their phones. It sounds silly, but it's true. They are finding enough meaning in that to avoid the big questions. And so we have a whole generation now that has been developing for a while, but that is cultivating shallowness and superficiality, which is why we have no culture also. It's why we're not building cathedrals. It's why we're not... We're no longer aspiring for great things, no longer aspiring for virtue, because no one thinks that matters. So the, the crisis before us is really both, I mean, it's on many levels. It's incredibly deep. It's incredibly dangerous. I used to say that you know, if you want to go to evangelize in the, old, in the, in the dark ages, you, know, you could convert a, a barbarian tribe by converting the king. Hmm. Now, if you go to like Scandinavia and try to convert them, They'll just change the channel, or they'll put their earbuds, you know, plugs in, or whatever. It's, it's a lot harder, but the but the arguments are still there. The truth is still there, and the the Catholic challenge is twofold. It's to realize that we are in a world at war. That has always been a truth. I don't mean to just mean war like what's going on in the Middle East. I mean a spiritual war. It's, that's inevitable. But at the same time, we have to be happy warriors. We have to inspire people by our example. We have to live the faith. We were, we were given this earth to enjoy as well as to make converts and to, and to get to know God. But it, that's the thing. To be happy warriors is the crucial thing. And I hope that the book, in fact, I've seen that the book actually can help produce happy warriors. And I hope that to, in this new edition it can continue to do so. Wow, Mr. Crocker, you know, this is uh, really incredible. You're dropping a lot of truth bombs here. And it reminds me of uh, the fact that I, I think a lot of people think that, that we live in the most important uh, time of our life. In the history of the world, it's, it's right now, right? It's our experience, and, and that's it. And I'm wondering, you know, from a historical perspective, um, have you seen any sort of crisis in the church that you would say resembles something like we're experiencing now? And, and maybe give us a little ray of hope and, to let us know that it's going to be okay. Well, it's def there's definitely room for hope, um, and it, there's nothing that I think really resembles this today. However, however, they, the church has been through many dark periods before. It has been yeah. persecuted, obviously, endlessly. If you were a pope in the, in the worst of the dark ages, your chances of being killed in office were like... 30 <laughs> percent. So, and we, we've had popes who have been kidnapped, you know, as recently as Napoleon kidnapped a, a pope. Um, but but in, I'll tell you, I, I had the experience of both updating this book and updating A History of the American Military, which is coming out later, I guess early next year. And uh, updating Triumph made me optimistic. <laughs> because huh. the church has been through so much and recovered so often. And whenever things, that, I mean, I know it sounds a little bit like a cliche breath, but whenever the chips are down, you know, a new generation of saints rises up. It happens over and over again. Um, but we, when I was really, uh, updating the, the history of the American military, I was thinking, wow, we were once a great country. We sure aren't now. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> it was... It was, it was it was much more depressing. <laughs> so I, I do think our, as far as we can have faith and hope, it's in the church. And it, it's the church that will, if America can be restored, it will be the church that does it. And there is every reason to believe that no matter how dire the situation now, um, that the church will, in fact, come back. And I have to sort of assume – well, I shouldn't assume, but I, 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 you know, one hates to be uh, whistling Dixie, as it were, but there are – there are there's so many bad currents and trends. We read about them all the time, but there's some good ones too. And I think in the end of the day, those are going to win out. You know, that kind of remi reminds me, Mr. Crocker, of I was reading Cornelius Alapide's commentary on the Gospels a few weeks ago, and whenever he talks about the difficulties, the sufferings, he rejoices in it and says, because. Uh, Cornelius Lapide, 16th century Jesuit, he talks about the Jesuits thrive on suffering and persecution. And the more they're persecuted, the more saints they get, the more heroic they get, the more virtuous things they do. And whenever things are too easy, they all start to go down. And it makes me think about our times where 
sin abounds, grace abounds ever more. And I'm looking to see all these cardinals and bishops and priests that are, are finally standing up. And it gives me hope. Um, what say you, Mr. Crocker? Yeah, no, no. Courage is the essential virtue and aspiring after heroism. I really think that a lot of the problem is that people are setting their their standards way too low. There used to be, in politics, there used to be a phrase called defining deviance down. (laughs) Where This is how a society declines. You think, well, that's not so bad. Well, no, that's not so bad either. No, that's not so bad. No, they are bad. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We have to stop defining deviancy down, and we have to start embracing the, the, the courage to go after heroic moral virtue. And um, it only takes, you know, a few people to stand up and be counted. I actually think this is how we could maybe – I think you're writing about this, too, in the, in the near future. If We know, all know that the left, the secular left, the anti-religious left, has had the long march to the institutions, stealing everything from us, right? the popular culture, everything, um, academia. But how do you stop that? And the, the, the only way to stop that is for men to stay up, stand up and say no. Mm. And if they're going to stand up and say no effectively, they're going to have to have some good reasons. And all those reasons are provided by the church. And that's where I think if we have enough men who will stand up with heroic virtue and say, no, we're not doing that. No, we're not doing that either. And no, we're not doing that either. And they may get fired. They may get persecuted. They may even go to jail. But if you have enough people who do that, it will inspire others. And you know, the old line, the blood of the, mod- the blood of the martyrs is the seabed of the church. That is true. And it may be a hard truth, but it's a, it's, it's a truth. It's a fact. Amen. Amen. So, well, uh, we're just we about go. out of time. Where can people stay in touch with what you're putting out, and where can people get the book? I'm a very low-tech guy. I don't have a website or anything. But if you just click on uh, Amazon, and I've written, I don't know, 10 books or so, um, on history and some novels, which I think are both, I hope, fun and inspiring. Um, so Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all the, the uh, uh, books a million, all the usual book outlets. Perfect. Well, check it out. You can go to Amazon and check out his books there. there I, I, mean, I haven't read all of them, but I have read this uh, parts of this one, and I have to say it's very good. So praise be to God. God bless you. God love you, Mr. Crocker, and have a blessed day. Thank you so much. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with more Catholic Drive Time right after this. Debbie Giorgiani is joining us. We're going to be talking about this little boy. Maybe you've heard of him. Carlo Acutis? I don't know. We'll talk about it. One second.